thanks for those comments. Thank you for the C Ball for the very kind introduction. And his uh, comments about uh, leaving the argument is that there was some kind of uh, uh, trauma uh, to leaving the argument. But the truth is, when I left the argument in 2009, I rediscovered my first man in life. It's just the long since. So, really happy about that. Yeah, well, with Professor Hayes' comments in his book, which I read in preparation for this session, it, uh, I strongly agree, and uh, it, it was almost like a light went off that I saw this idea of the ratchet effect you know, that you see every time there is some kind of crisis in government. The powers of government expand, and then even if the crisis seems to have okay, the powers, uh, they might decrease somewhat, but they never decrease back where they were before the crisis. So that, that, that is it. I think that's a powerful way of expressing some of the things that happen in government. But I think that uh, Professor Hayes' analysis focuses mainly on crises of economics and war, which we can really focus on. And uh, I think that you can look at there are other kinds of crises that the government faces, and it also leads to the similar type of ratchet effect. And so, uh, Professor Walsh kind of mentioned that some of the books I've got a new book coming out in the fall. It's called Shall We Wait for the President? How America Deals with Disasters and How You Should as well. Look at that. How America dealt with a whole, so a whole series of disasters, not just economics, not just war, but also uh, weather, for example. And, um, uh, the possibility of um, dangerous diseases like you know, the 1918 flu, um, possibility of bioterrorism, so there's a whole range of possible disasters. And for tonight, I want to talk a little bit about weather disasters and how government has reacted to them. And one thing that we see that leads to some of these increases in government power is the increase in the citizenry's expectations of how to react to and how to deal with the disaster. So for a long time, uh, and in much of the 19th century that the person he talks about, uh, government didn't react to disasters, not only because uh, they were small, you know, there were a few departments, and the, the, the attorney general didn't have the secretary, he was the secretary, but because communications had not advanced to the point where people didn't know about it. So in 1811, for example, there was a devastating earthquake in Missouri, and President Madison didn't know about the earthquake for six months. So this perfect happens, and there's all kinds of destruction and toll, but the powers of being in Washington weren't even aware of it. And so it was only the advent of a matter of technology that we started being aware of crises that happened in the, uh, in the short term. And I remember actually when the, um, in a few years ago, I think it was 2013, there was an earthquake in Washington, D.C., very rare event. I happened to be in Seattle at the time, so 3,000 miles away. And I knew within seconds on Twitter that there had been an earthquake 3,000 miles away where I was thinking about it back in 1811, it took six months for the TV to find out about that at the So weather events have really helped track this rise in government and growth of both the government powers but also in governmental expectations. And so, well, the first one I really look at in depth is the 1889 flood that happened in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which spoke about in the uh, Cape Cod. Basically what happened, there was a heavy rains, and there was some flooding, and there was a poorly constructed dam, and that dam broke, and wiped away the entire town. The whole town of Johnstown, 2,000 people were killed with a huge, huge loss of life, terrible event. Well, the elders of Johnson, they used this relatively new technology at the time of the telegraph, and they telegraphed Washington. And not uh, like in Washington City, they told our president at the time, President Harrison, and they told him that things were quite dire here and we need assistance. And President Harrison telegraphs back and he basically says, Not my job. It's up to the government, it's up to the government, the government has responsibility, it's not my area of responsibility, it should be handled like that. And citizens of Johnstown telegraphed back to him. You know, saying thank you. They thanked him for the response. Now, think about today, if you had a president in the face of a weather disaster or any kind of global coronavirus <laughs> crisis who said, not my responsibility, it's up to the governor or it's up to the mayor, there would be lawsuits and press conferences and denunciations. And so, just to think of how different that is. Now, I don't mean by this to say that President Harrison was in any way callous or didn't care about what happened in Johnstown. There was a fundraiser in Washington for the people of Johnstown, and he went 
and he gave three hundred dollars out of his own pocket, which was a considerable sum at the time, to pay uh, to help alleviate the suffering for of people in Johnson. So it was not an expectation that government money was going to come in and solve the problem, but the president went out there, took out his wallet, and he actually sent sent the donation to the public pay for it. Now. Over time, as we had more of these weather catastrophes, and you had more and more instantaneous communication, including the uh, device, for example, radio, and you had um, train travel and air travel, and so you could get around the country faster, but then you had additional weather catastrophes, people would be aware of them more quickly, and there would be more of a demand that the government do something. So in 1927, there was a terrible flood in Mississippi. And at the time, the president was President Coolidge. Now, president Coolidge was not a big fan of active government. And in fact, he wanted to keep the, government, the responsibility of government relatively small. He did not want to extend governmental responsibilities. However, there was a lot of pressure. This time, with the rise of the modern media, you would not only have a situation where you, you would have people aware of it, but you might have uh, criticisms of the president, or, uh, or even criticisms in, in the popular culture. And now, uh, today, if something happens, the president has not put your hat on the Lennon show or Jimmy Fallon or the show. Well, back then, the equivalent was Will Rogers. And he said about the um, delays that Coolidge had in dealing with the 1927 flood is that he's intentionally delaying so, quote, that those needing relief will conveniently die in the meantime. Such was the uh, level of uh, the flow we were at the time. Uh, so, so President Coolidge did, did do something about it. He assigned Herbert Hooper to go deal with it. Herbert Hooper uh, was known as a, a kind of a master of disaster. He dealt with uh, some of the hunger issues in World War One and the uh, reconstruction of World War One. And so he sent Hooper. But it wasn't necessarily because President Coolidge favored active government. In fact, he was opposed to it. But he just think, he thought Hoover was a pain in the butt. In fact, he said about Hoover, that man has given me unsolicited advice for six years and all they're wrong. So to, to a large extent, it was a desire to get Hoover out of his hair. They did it. Hoover went, he was all over the place, and he helped uh, bring uh, private sector efforts together, volunteers together to try and solve some of the problems that were facing in the city. And it actually helped him become uh, president, it helped him build his president, the great resume. He was one of the first graduates of Stanford engineer, uh, but he really built his resume as someone who responded to disasters in the city. Disaster response was, was one of the pieces of his jet, uh, his, uh, his resume that helped make him president in 1928. Uh, but unfortunately, he wasn't so good at dealing with economic disasters, but that's another story. He was provided with a great impression. And, um, Really, uh, this is kind of a sweet example too. But fast forwarding a little bit, you know, after that period that um, Professor Ritz has, and he actually being left as the startup, uh, there's a big spike in what uh, in the growth of government with the uh, both the Great Depression and with World War II, right, right here in the middle of the chart. And so the next time we have a massive weather disaster after that period, we have in 1969. There was Hurricane Camille. And when Hurricane Camille, President Nixon was in charge, and he flew over the disaster area. Before we knew that presidents weren't allowed to fly over the disaster area, or the person was between that and over that. Actually, um, in another chapter, I hope not to talk about today, but uh, I also have a chapter on uh, civil disobedience and urban riots that we're seeing in Baltimore recently. Uh, there were terrible riots in Washington after the assassination of, of Dr. King. And one of the things that Lyndon Johnson did, who was also at his way saying about the riots, is he flew in a helicopter over the riots and looked down on the devastation and White House photographer took a picture of him looking eerily like President Bush looking down over Katrina. Uh, that photograph did not become iconic, however, it will be in my book about that at all. So Nixon puts together a team and he sends Vice President Agnew down to the affected area to, to try and deal with it. But in contrast to the situation with Hoover, what we had here was a whole host of departments. And I'm just going to read this whole list of departments that were involved. We had Agriculture, Commerce, Fund, AGW, which is Health, Education, Welfare, the so three departments all in one, uh, Justice, Treasury. And interesting that there was no Department of 
uh, of Homeland Security or Environmental Protection Agency involved, only because they hadn't been invented yet. But I'm sure if they had been invented, they would have been there as well. And Nixon calls Agnew back to the White House and asks him what he learned from it. One of the things that Agnew learned was that there was insufficient warning about hurricanes. And Nixon asked him to come back to recommendations. And one of the recommendations that came out of this was the, uh, the, the five level hurricane warning system we have today, in category one, category two, category three hurricanes. That, that was actually a um, byproduct of, of hurricane field and its connection. But we really see what Professor Hayes is getting at here in, with the growth of government being the ability of government to dictate more and more, and in some cases, uh, to finishing freedom. Because what happened in reaction to that was one of the departments, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, went and told the affected areas that they would be, uh, they would only get their funds if they, um, if they insisted that their schools were in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So they were using the prospect of federal funds and federal supplies as a cudgel to get the, uh, to get the state to comply with the federal law that the state had uh, pointed them out compliant. Now, Mississippi had a senator named John Sanders, who was a Democrat and um, was not so enamored of this attempt by HW to, uh, to condition funds on the adherence uh, to, to certain well being laws. And so he told them that the, the, the Nixon administration would not get any of the missile funding that they wanted, and uh, he was on the Appropriations Committee. And so the Department of HCW back then. Now, obviously, the promotion of civil rights is a uh, valuable, a, a good cause. But we have here, right in this moment, this idea of a sense that now you could have government making uh, uh, financial contributions to states, financial right? contributions, financial assistance to states, contingent upon the state doing what the government wanted. We saw this a little later in the, uh, in the 1980s with the advent of the seatbelt laws, where the government said, we only give you a certain transportation funding if you uh, would be here and make uh, and, 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 uh, certain laws, uh, and the seatbelt laws, the seatbelt laws, uh, you, you have to adhere to the seatbelt laws, uh, or establish the seatbelt law in your state, or you will get a certain transportation funding. So once the government has this thing about the transportation funding or any kind of funding, Turn monitors off, they get to dictate more and more what those states do. And so that really runs contrary to the original notion of federalism, as it's in the Constitution. You know, in 1992, President Bush was in power, the first President Bush, when Hurricane Andrew happens in Florida. And he was, um, he was damaged politically by what was seen as a slow reaction to that hurricane. In fact, there was one woman in an official there who said something like, where in the hell was the damn cavalry? And that when it was before we had YouTube to do the viral, when we showed all the number of news feeds. And so this kind of was an emblematic moment that showed that the, the Bush administration seemed to be behind the curve on responding to it. Now overall, the Bush administration actually did send um, the military down there and they sent a, a host of supplies, I mean, 7,000 troops, um, additional thousand Marines, two ten cities, uh, four hundred thousand meals, twenty kitchen meals. So they, they did send a lot of federal research down there. But nonetheless, the impression was that President Bush forty one was not on top of it when dealing with that. In a hurricane in the election, remember, it was not a, a, a foregone conclusion that President Bush was going to lose to Bill Clinton in 1992. In fact, he at one point had almost 90% approval rating, and Democrats didn't want to get into the race in 1992 because they thought Bush was going to be unbeatable. Obviously, that was not the case, but the hurricane Andrew response was one of the damaging pieces in, in that, in, um, in kind of a piercing the armor of uh, Bush's apparently bill. Now, when George W. Bush, President of my work, came to power, he had a very keen sense of how the 1992 Andrew disaster had harmed his father's presidency. And he was determined to be very reactive and very quick in terms of dealing with disasters. In fact, as late as 2004, there were articles talking about how good President Bush was at responding to weather-based disasters 
talking about how um, you know, there was a political motive behind it, but giving him grudging credit for being so good at dealing with disasters, and having Andrew Carr, who led uh, HW Bush's response to the uh, in Hurricane Andrew crisis. Uh, and just having a very strong sense of it, uh, spending a lot of time on female-related issues. And so it is ironic that President Bush is now known for the Katrina disaster of the, uh, the inability to respond to a terrible flood uh, and hurricane that took place in, in the Louisiana area, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Mississippi as well. So uh, President Bush was, um, his, his presidency was forever damaged by that. And I was working in the Bush administration, and I wanted to share a couple of stories that I saw that really um, brought back uh, Professor Hayes' uh, paper and comments uh, about how government responds to crisis, where government gets ideas in, in crisis, really certainly talking about three, uh, three areas where the, the ideas come into crisis are ideas that are kind of off the shelf, that um, have been kind of laying around somebody and propose, propose and say, hey, you know, I'll see that one. Second, there are air ideas that I guess um, the administration sort of wants to do anyway, and they fit within the model of what they're wrapping in the disaster. And then third, they go out and actually see new ideas of what happens in the disaster, is instead of selectively picking the one with three categories, you just take all of them. And so that was an example. And there's also just a sense of, of chaos and impotence of well, what can we do about that? Remember one incident that um, was we had a whole bunch of people together in uh, what was called the uh, deputy scene in the White House, where we talked about what, what resource we have available, how we're going to handle it, and we decided that from then on daily, we would have the deputy secretaries of the various departments get together and talk at a very high level of what was going on, what was going on, and how we um, strictly brief, know what was going on, know what their departments were doing, and know what they needed from the other departments. So I, we set up these meetings, and I asked one of my staffers who attend these meetings to report back to me. And I said, well, uh, how was that, the, that first meeting? You know, the, the very small tight group, uh, uh, how, how did it go? And it was effective. And he said, well, it's kind of like this. Can you step up to the microphone so we can hear you? Because every deputy secretary and every federal official from far more than just a few dozen agencies that Professor Hicks talked about, they all came and they all were asked the staff, and the meeting that was supposed to be this tight knit group was a, effectively a cattle call or nothing to get done. Another meeting I was at, there was, uh, it was this a meeting of deputies in the White House. Um, and, and key deputy secretaries. Uh, we were sitting there talking about uh, Katrina response, and somebody comes into the room uh, with a little disheveled, a little stressed out, and he starts saying, uh, the President just made me in charge of the whole uh, response operation. If you were doing anything with any resources, you need to tell me and let me know right away, and that's going to be from now on. And the deputy secretary from Homeland Security looks at this fellow, who was a senior aide to the President of Hawaii, who said, we're in the White House, but and the deputy secretary of the DHS looks at this all and says, uh, excuse me, who are you? Uh, which kind of gave a sense of how, uh, how disorganized things were at the time. So uh, I would say that overall, um, there is this sense that every time a disaster happens, there's greater and greater expectations on the president, the sense that, if you go back to President Harrison, uh, said thank you, uh, said he wouldn't do anything, he got a thank you, or President Bush, it all seemed like the expectation that he would take hammers and nails and go down to New Orleans and build the city itself. Uh, we saw recently with President Obama and got the, the Gulf oil spill, and um, his daughter said to him, I've got to have you put the whole game. And, and the way it's gone down in Laura, in fact, I don't know if you uh, maybe watched the uh, White House Correspondence Dinner this week, but um, there's this guy named uh, Luther, who's played by the Canadian um, Chief and Chief Peel, and he's um, President Obama's um, his anger translator. So President Obama would say something neutral, and then Luther would say something angry. And what Luther said, uh, or President Obama was bossing around his conscience, so Luther said, Does y'all remember when I had that big old hole in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, and then I plugged it? And so it's gotten down to the war as if this is something that, or at least in Luther's mind, that this is something that President Obama did when it's not really a capacity of the president to do these things. And so I guess in sum, I would say, that we need to be very careful in managing our expectations going forward about what the government can do 
and it should do, because there are certain crises and disasters where we do need governmental assistance. So for example, if there's a bioterror attack, we can't just really go to the local government office in the um, Tom Iowa and ask them to take care of it. There are some things that, that only federal expertise can handle. But the idea that the federal government has to respond to every localized weather disaster is something that is beyond its capability, and by putting these expectations on it, it puts all of us in a less less safe and more dangerous and um, and more as the professor said, more expensive situation. So uh, those are my thoughts and uh, I would uh, love to hear as uh, Professor Bates and any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you.